we're going to revisit um, together today virtually some of the ideas around Peggy Guggenheim's collection in Venice. And we're going to touch upon um, aspects of her life and also her relationship with Pollock and how she really supported Jackson Pollock's career as an artist, which catapulted him to fame. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to do a little screen share here. Okay, so this is a really good movie. You can get it on any smart TV. And this is Peggy Guggenheim, Art Attic. Let's just hear the trailer. It seems to me that you have a, an intuition for talent even before it's realized. Yes, thank you. What do these pictures mean to you, yourself? Oh, well, they've become more or less the most important part of my life. I can't imagine now living without them. She'd carved out a niche for herself and she filled it and she made it as a collector and as a kind of collector that never quite existed before. She wanted this art as a mirror for her own strangeness. I think sex and art went absolutely hand in hand in her brain. She was talked about as such a slut for doing the same thing that all the men around her were doing. Peggy is a sort of model for the liberated woman. Peggy appealed to me because of her eccentricities. It's just a wonderfully colorful family. The Guggenheims progressed from selling door to door to having these enormous fortunes. You must have been extremely shocked when your father died on the Titanic. Yes. She actually helped artists to leave Europe, to the United States, so she very much saved artists. Wound up in a country. Yes, yes, I know that. She had managed to put together one of the great collections of modern art for the almost laughable sum of $40,000. Some of these prices are subjective because they're so rare. But you're talking billions, billions of dollars. My father showed with her. My mother showed with her. She was a big part of their lives in 1946, yeah, when I was three. I first met Jackson Pollock when he was working as a carpenter in my uncle's museum. So I rescued him from that. And how do you feel about walking down the ramp at the Guggenheim Museum and seeing your paintings in a completely different environment? Oh, my uncle's garage, yes. But it looks like a garage, doesn't it? I think if he sold us now, he'd turn in his grave. I came to Venice, which I'd always adored, which had been my dream city. And you love this crazy life? Definitely, yes. It was all about art and love. You can hear the full interview on the Guggenheim Museum website. Okay, if you look up Peggy Guggenheim, you can hear the audio tape of that. And um, you can also watch the movie, which ha it has amazing footage about her interaction with all these famous artists. So uh, I'm gonna do a little presentation in uh, three sections. First, we'll go over some of the um, aspects of Peggy Guggenheim's life. And then we'll talk about her relationship with Jackson Pollock. And lastly, we'll look at some of the um, works in her collection in Venice, which is really, really vast. So um, Peggy Guggenheim herself referred to herself as an art addict. She was born in 1898, died in 1979. And um, she's most famous for her collection from 1938 to 1946. But she did co continue to collect throughout her life. So as the tape said, she was born into a wealthy New York, uh, the Guggenheim family. She was of Jewish descent and she was the daughter of Benjamin uh, Guggenheim who died in the Titanic in 1912. Um, that's a misspelling, sorry about that. She was the niece of Solomon R. Guggenheim who established the Guggenheim Foundation which later became the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. And once Peggy had amassed this amazing collection of modern art, she uh, loaned the works to the Guggenheim um, collection in New York City and eventually created her home museum, which um, has a home in Venice on the Grand Canal. 
So at the age of 21, she inherited $2.5 million, which I think today would be about $45 million. So she is a very, very wealthy socialite. And it's so interesting. She embarks on a life completely outside of what would have been expected by a socialite. So she goes to Paris and um, she's working in a bookstore. And there she meets these avant-garde artists and writers such as Man Ray, uh, Marcel Duchamp and many others. So she winds up immersing herself into actually this bohemian life, interacting with these great artists. And um, the artists, especially uh, Marcel Duchamp, would advise her on what to collect, right? Because she hadn't been trained in the arts. Um, so she opens up a modern art gallery in London in 1938. And she collects the works first of European artists and then later the American artists such as Jackson Pollock. And she literally puts uh, Pollock and the other New York artists on the map, catapulting them to fame. But especially Jackson Pollock becomes the front runner of the abstract expressionists in terms of fame. So um, she came to the United States because uh, she was fleeing Nazism. And um, of course, even the artwork itself would have been considered degenerate at that time. And she was Jewish, right? So she fled. And many of the artists had to flee as well. So um, she did wind up returning to Europe in 1945. She settled in Venice, Italy. And that's where she has her great museum today, which is on the Grand Canal in Venice. And um, we'll take a look at the website itself is very rich. It's, it's really a very good resource for modern art. So Peggy Guggenheim was married twice and um, she had two children by her first husband and she has eight grandchildren. And then later in 1941, she married the now very famous artist, Max Ernst. He's a German surrealist. So when she moved to New York City, uh, fleeing you know, world, the events uh, prior to World War II, she, um, prior to that, she had plans to create a museum in Paris, that never happened. So 1941, she moves to New York City, and then she opens Art of This Century on 57th Street in Manhattan. It was a combination of a museum and a gallery. So uh, there were three rooms that were just for display, and there was one room in the front where it was a commercial art gallery and she sold work. So Peggy Guggenheim sold work as a gallerist, but she also collected work as well. She purchased the work herself. And at one point she said she collected one painting every day. And now these artists who she collected are world famous artists. So um, in terms of Pollock in 1943, she gave Pollock his first solo show and she gave him a contract we'll, which we'll discuss a little more later where he didn't have to work at a job. She said in that interview, she rescued him from being a carpenter. Um, he, he was also a custodian. And um, so because of Peggy Guggenheim giving him a monthly stipend, uh, he didn't have to work at a job. He could just devote his time exclusively to painting. And she also gave, uh, lent rather, Lee and Pollock money for the down payment on the house so they could move from New York City to the Springs East Hampton. And today their home is of course a national landmark. So her gallery closes in 1947 and she returns to Europe and settles in Venice, Italy. So here are some examples of the gallery and it would have been broken down into abstract art at that time, they called abstract art also non-objective art. What is non-objective art? Meaning it is not copying, in quotes, objective reality. In fact, it's not even representing a thing outside of itself. 
So Pollock's work is groundbreaking, for example. It's 100% abstract art, right? It's not replicating something that you would see and then copying it and representing that. Um, sometimes Pollock and the other artists would choose titles for the works. In Pollock's case, the titles came afterwards, so he didn't set out with a, a concrete idea in mind. She also collected surrealist art, which we'll take a look at later. And um, surrealist art, of course, the word surreal means more than real. Surrealist artists are diving, delving within to their subconscious, their irrational self, their dreams, their imagination. And that is what is their painting or making sculptures. They want to jog also the viewer's imagination. So um, surrealist art takes many forms and we'll look at that later. Kinetic art is art that actually moves. So I'll show you later, for example, Alexander Calder makes a mobile and it moves with the a gust of a little bit of air flowing past it, right? Whoop. Okay, so when she returned to Venice um, in 1948, she did display a collection at the Venice Biennale. And then a year later, she opens the um, Peggy Guggenheim collection um, in this spectacular, spectacular palace which is now um, a world famous museum. It has the largest collection of European art. I mean, of abstract modern art in Europe. And it's a major tourist destination in Venice. And here she is on the Grand Canal with her beloved dogs. And that's where she lived until the end of her life in what was at 1979. So uh, let's, let's explore a little bit about Peggy and Pollock. So here, um, just ignore that text. I don't know why I put that there. But anyway, um, here Peggy Guggenheim is shown with Pollock in front of his very famous mural. This was a pivotal piece for Pollock. Peggy Guggenheim commissioned Pollock to make a mural for her hallway. And it was very, very large. It's very, it's long. It's it's a mural size painting, but technically you could say it's not a mural because it wasn't painted directly on the wall. Um, Peggy Guggenheim was advised not to have Pollock painted on the wall, so this way it would be movable uh, years later. So the mural, um, as you can see here, this is a turning point for Pollock in 1943. So what is, is so groundbreaking about this mural? For one thing, we start to see the emergence of Pollock's action painting. He's using his whole entire body and you could see the gestures and strokes of paint. You can trace back his actions. And this is one of his larger works. And so it's almost like you might say it's a dance of paint. It's highly rhythmic. And it becomes increasingly abstract. So you might see little images in there like a horse or a, uh, dancing figures or little creatures or faces. But you could also look at it purely as lines and gestures. We also see, which was emerging before as well, Pollock's work becomes very painterly. So when we see this painting in real life, we see texture, we see brush strokes, we see dripping, we clearly see the artist's mark. And this idea of action painting, that the actual final artwork and the action of the artist moving merge into one where it becomes very evident on the canvas. So um, later on, of course, this leads to Pollock's drip painting, right? So this painting has, has a very interesting history. It is now in a museum in Iowa. If you want to hear more about how it wound up in Iowa, I can put in the chat, we had a talk by the curator 
And we do have a, an hour long program explaining the details about the history of this mural, okay? So as I said, Peggy Guggenheim lends um, Pollock and Lee money for the down payment on the house in the Springs. Before that, they were living in New York City in a small apartment. And there's even a story which is true about that mural painting. The apartment was so small, Pollock illegally um, took down a wall and they used to like, you know, to hide that they broke a wall in the apartment. They would just take out the debris little by little at night and stick it in the garbage. Um, but anyway, in the Springs, they had, Pollock had a barn studio, Lee painted in a room upstairs. And of course they had a beautiful property and a home which you can now visit, it's a national landmark. Now, what was the role of Lee Krasner in all of this? Lee Krasner was also an action painter. She was also an abstract expressionist. She always did her art, you know, she never gave up her art as the wife of Pollock. However, she didn't promote her career. She, they decided as a couple that Pollock would earn the money and she would advance his career. So she managed the professional aspect of Pollock's life. Lee is the one who went to Peggy Guggenheim and negotiated for the stipend. Lee is the one who went to Guggenheim and negotiated for the down payment on the house, okay? So one might say the success of abstract expressionism as a professional, um, rising movement of art that that makes New York and America the top of the art world suddenly, you could trace it back to these two great women, Peggy Guggenheim and Lee Krasner and other women as well. And here is the house today in Springs East Hampton and there's the barn studio. We're located about 100 miles east of New York City. And um, it's a beautiful area surrounded by uh, water and um, the light is remarkable because it is surrounded by bays and beaches. It was very affordable. They purchased this for $5,000 in 1946. And um, the other artists also gathered in East Hampton, like de Kooning and, and the great, all the abstract expressionists. There were a large community of artists who lived here at that time. And of course, Pollock's art eventually leads him to drip painting, where he places the painting on the floor, works from all four sides, drips paint from, um, not from art paint, but from house paint, and using the stick or the, the stirrer or the brush as a stick, dripping paint above the canvas. And um, Peggy Guggenheim, one of the most famous paintings she collected was Alchemy by Pollock. That's one of his early drip paintings. And you can see that at the Guggenheim Museum. So Pollock, this is Life magazine, the premier magazine at that time. And he is uh, noted, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? So one might say because of Peggy Guggenheim's support that this is pretty remarkable. Out of all the artists she was collecting and dealing with, she chose Pollock to give him the stipend so he could just paint and supported him, as I said, with the down payment on the house represented him in the gallery with a solo show and also group shows. And um, he catapults to fame as the front runner of the abstract expressionists. And then all the other abstract expressionists rise to fame as well within their own lifetime. Now, just for the beginners here, what do we mean by abstract expressionism? Abstract expressionism is a very physical way of painting. You might say it's a release of energy, right? It's dripping, pouring, scraping, brushing, taking away. The artist's mark is very evident. And that's what makes it different than abstract art that came before it. And it, it really happens right here on Long Island, on the east end of Long Island. 
And um, because of this, the art world shifts, the capital of the art world shifts from Paris to New York City. It puts America on American artists on the map as important artists. So here we see in Peggy Guggenheim's collection in Venice, there we see alchemy. So let's take a look at alchemy here. Here it is. So how is Pollock making these lines? He's making them not with a paintbrush, but by carefully dripping paint from sticks. And you can see Pollock said, I can control the flow of paint. So it's not like he's just randomly dripping paint. He's making patterns, he's making rhythm, he's making texture. It's highly composed. Now, this is also um, going into the Pollock Gallery in the Peggy Guggenheim collection. You can see some of Pollock's earlier work. This is, this is one of my favorite paintings, so it was just such a thrill to see it in real life. And what is Pollock doing here? Anybody, so I'm not doing all the talking, would anyone like to unmute and tell us, what do you see going on here? Anyone? When you look at this. What do you know? Lovers kissing. Could be two lovers, Joyce. Where yeah. do you see, where do you see the two lovers? Can you describe it? At the top, there's the black head. Mm hmm. And where's the other one? And the other one's just below, and it's like she's looking up. Interesting. Just, just above the curl. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then they got the clothing. It almost reminds me of Japanese. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What reminds you so, of Japanese? Um, the flowing, the flowing gown. It was like a flowing gown. Uh -huh. and on the other side, on the other side, there's the box. But yeah, it a, should be on the woman's side. But uh, <laughs> that's what that's what I see. Yeah, during this period, a lot of times Pollock would have these uh, rectangles embedded into his paintings. You'll notice it in many of his paintings from this period. Anyone else want to comment on this one? Anything you notice? Joyce, I have a feeling that I, I've never seen this one, oddly enough, but mm -hmm. um, I, I the first impression I got from like was Basquat, you know? His what? Excuse Basquat. Me? You know, the, the painter Basquat. I, oh, I Bob, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I wonder if he saw that. Oh, I'm sure Basquiat, of course, was familiar with Pollock. What 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 reminds you of Basquiat? Just the figures, the way you know. Um, I mean, I don't know if you would call it surrealist, but it's a fantastical kind of painting, right? Yeah, well, that's a good point because uh, Jackson Pollock. He, he studied all the movements of that era. So we see um, the influence of surrealism. In fact, the surrealists were exiled, they came to New York, right? So the surrealists would interact with the younger artists living in New York City. They would share all these different ideas. Pollock would go to the Museum of Modern Art. He saw the huge show called Dada and Surrealism, right? Pollock was also influenced by Picasso, where you could even see it in the way he did the head there. That's, that's the what throat. I was gonna say. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. The, the, head, the head with the, the face going in different directions, uh, that's very Picasso-like. Absolutely, yes. And then we also see someone said Basquiat. Basquiat uses a lot of signs and symbols. And Pollock is sort of doing that, but it's not clear what these little markings could be. In this period, it, his artwork also has sort of a mythical feeling to it. And he's also influenced by indigenous people's art. Okay, he has a whole set of books in his um, bookshelf about um, indigenous people. And you can directly see sometimes mask-like images or sort of just, um, emulating this idea of mythology, okay? But it, overall, it shows the idea that Pollock is going within. 
and it relates with Jungian psychology. He's pulling from his subconscious mind. He's pulling out these images from within. He's no longer painting what we would say objective reality, right? And also you see the paint is very fluid. It's very painterly. This is another one. Pollock um, from this period, um, he has several paintings where he made couples. This one is called Two. I don't know, what do you make of this one? Anyone? Do you see the male and female in there? What would you say the overall feeling is in the picture, anyone? It seems like separation to me. It looks like one of the figures on the left is facing away and the figure on the right is like reaching out. Anyone else? And it looks like the death mask from um, the plague years on the top, the big nose. And um, if you go in the middle, there's a little protrusion going to the to the little black hole. Mm -hmm. It almost looks yeah. a little phallic also, right? It's yeah. like phallic. And then in. there's a little back cleaner in the corner. <laughs> No, well, maybe that's a vacuum cleaning. So vacuum cleaning. What else is new? No, I'm just teasing. Um, it's interesting. Um, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist. And when you look at these pictures, there's no definitive answer in the interpretation, right? Um, but it is interesting. There was an issue in the marriage. Uh, one of the issues was that Lee didn't want to have children and Pollock did. And that created a rift in their marriage. And of course, also Pollock struggled with alcoholism, which uh, made their marriage really difficult. And Lee became kind of a caretaker. And then of course that led to Pollock's death in 1956 when he was drinking and driving. So sometimes in his artworks, you see this, it's almost looks to me like a struggle. It looks like a struggle. Um, here is, one of Pollock's paintings where he's sort of dragging the paint around and eventually dragging, meaning you can sort of see where he would kind of drag the brush here. And eventually Pollock also would squirt the paint directly out of a tube and drag it around. So um, in this one, you see this, the action painting going on, you can clearly see his movement. And you see these little eyes peering through, he calls it eye in the heat, but that's not to say he started out with that idea. Um, sometimes, as I said, he would just name his paintings one, you know, 27, whatever numbers. And then friends would suggest titles to him. So he didn't start out with a theme, right? He didn't say, I'm gonna do this painting about eyes in the heat. And he says that he let the painting lead. So it's an improvisational act of painting, right? We At the beginning, someone mentioned music. This was inspired in part by jazz. Just like jazz, jazz is improvisational, yet there's a structure similar to the other modern artists at this time. The modern painters like Pollock. <laughs> this one was not on view, but I love this one. It's called Enchanted Forest. Okay, so let's take a little trip to the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice. And the collection is so massive that I'm not, I'm going to give a disclaimer. This is somewhat arbitrary to some degree because I picked out some of my favorites and just, I broke it up into different categories. So here we see the Palazzo Venere de Leone, which is, it's the English name is Peggy Guggenheim collection. And it's on the Grand Canal. So this would actually be the back of the museum. You would enter from the front, the I mean the other side, and then you would um, come through this beautiful sculpture garden. And there's this building, and then there's another building opposite the sculpture garden on the other side, which had a temporary um, exhibition in it. So the permanent collection is housed in this building. 
And you could see it's really spectacular. You could go onto the balcony, there's sculptures out there, and then you can enter back in and through. On the left is the Pollock Gallery. Um, and then there's, you know, it's quite large actually. And I was surprised that in addition to collecting the art of um, the World War II, like around that era and prior to World War II, there's actually an extensive collection of art from the 60s and 70s. So a broad category of Peggy Guggenheim's interest is surrealism. So uh, Rene Magritte is one of the most important surrealist artists from Belgium. And what Rene Magritte um, and like some of the surrealists fall into the category where they're painting let's say in quotes, realistically, with light and shadow, things like that, modeling. Um, but they're creating dream-like mysterious images. And Magritte is a master at just combining two opposite things to create a mystery. So here, what we see is day and night are simultaneously happening, right? It doesn't, it doesn't actually make sense. So you'll see as a major theme in surrealism, the idea of juxtaposing images that don't normally go together. And in Magritte's case, many times he uses opposites within the same painting. He has Salvador Dali, which it's a little hard to make out what's going on in this picture. Salvador Dali would, uh, according to what he said, he would put himself into a trance and then whatever he would see in, in this trance, he would paint without censorship. He was just faithful to whatever comes out, comes out. And he would often, um, there's a few things, often he would have what's called a double image where you could see an image in more than one way. So for example, that black shape on the right you might first see it just as a blob, but then you might see, oh, is that a bird? Like, is that a white bird beak down there? This is another major theme in modern art, the double image. It's like playing with the viewer's perception. Salvador Dali also would change kind of the materiality of things. So it appears to be maybe some sort of house, but then it's like wobbly and soft. It doesn't make sense. So I see Lena's trying to get in. Um, Teresa, could you let Lena in? Let's see, okay, let me, uh, very good, okay. Now Pablo Picasso, um, Pablo Picasso embraces all different uh, movements and his work is so, what's the, it's so innovative that we think of Picasso is a cubist, but in this work, it also, it's cubism, but it's also surrealism, right? And he's got these figures where the, the, the bodies become, again, the materiality of the body doesn't make sense, right? The neck is stretched out. The forms are sort of like geometric, but wobbly at the same time. And I love Picasso's work. It's like so serious and playful at the same time. And you see the cube is like the woman on the left, her breasts are sort of pointing, what appears to be breasts are pointing in two different directions, right? So it's almost like she's twisting to the left, but she's twisting to the right. And that's cubism where you have more than one view in a picture. This is uh, Peggy Guggenheim's former husband, Max Ernst. And Max Ernst is German. And um, he, he paints these dreamlike images, but he uses really unusual techniques to jog his imagination. So for example, it appears that that image in the mirror back there is probably, it could have been started by, um, a rubbing, or I'm not sure exactly, but 
there's several techniques he used. One is he would use frittage. He would rub um, a material like a, a drawing implement against a textured object to pick up the texture. And then he would pull images from that or use it as part of the form. He, whoop, everybody mute, check if you're muted. Hang on. Okay, everybody just check if you're muted, thank you. Um, also, he would use, it's called Declamania, where you make a painting on glass or another surface, and then you press your, your canvas or your, your paper against that wet paint, and you pull it off, and you get this surprise painted image, which you can then paint back into. So why did the Surrealists do these, these unusual techniques? They wanted to bypass the rational mind and they wanted to find techniques that would, would give an element of surprise and uh, maybe even something irrational to jog their imaginations. Because we tend to do, you have the same thoughts over and over and over again, don't we? And uh, this is Kandinsky and um, Peggy Guggenheim gave Kandinsky one of his first shows in uh, London. And um, Kandinsky is noted as one of the first abstract artists in the West. This one I just liked, Victor Bruno. I just love the, I love the simplicity of this face and the texture and the way the lines are sort of inscribed in there, it looks so modern and ancient at the same time. Uh, Peggy also collected sculpture by the most famous sculptures of modern art. This is Constantine Brancusi, who it's bird in space, but what is he doing? He's paring down um, the essence of the bird, the essence of flight, you might say the essence of upward movement. So artists like Pollock, he's painting movement. Uh, Brancusi is sculpting movement itself, light itself. You no longer need the details of a bird. That would just be a distraction, right? Here's Jean Arp. Again, you can see it's a figure but it's also highly simplified. It becomes abstract, eliminating all details. This was a beautiful piece at the museum. It's very, very large by Alexander Calder. Calder was a sculptor, an American sculptor who was a master at bending wire. And he made everything from jewelry to painting, sculpture. He even painted an airplane. He made utensils. I mean, he made little animals, he made a circus. His, his art was just so diverse, but he's very, very well known for these sculptures that move. And also he's bending wire. It's like lines in space uh, using wire. It's almost like he's drawing with wire. And here are two trajectories of Alexander Calder. The one um, on the right is in the sculpture garden. And this is um, a sculpture that's, you know, it's stable, it's not moving. And sometimes his sculptures were really very quite large. You can walk under them and around them. Sometimes Calder would have um, a stable sculpture, but with movable parts rising from the top. On the left, we see what um, Alexander coined the term mobile. So at first he did these pieces that um, they had, they were motorized, right? So that's how he got the parts to move. But then he let go of the motor and the mobile hangs from the ceiling. And as I said, the subtle shifts of the air or wind create the movement so the mobile will rotate. And um, many of his mobiles might remind you of almost like the galaxy, the planets, and that sort of thing. And of course, in the 1960s, I think every single child had a mobile in their bedroom. It became very, very popular. 
not an Alexander Calder one, but it was just, you know, a decorative object that became popular. So yeah. as I said, Peggy Guggenheim collect, collects the abstract expressionists working in New York. Willem de Kooning lived right down the street from Pollock. And um, he's not dripping paint like Pollock, but you could see this is very painterly. You can at times see drips on the painting. You could see the artist brushstroke. It's very physical. Now with Willem de Kooning, sometimes he made abstract art, but sometimes he also um, painted like this one. It's a figure on the beach. You could see there's like a flesh tone there. And that was an exception to the abstract expressionist, the idea of um, painting representational figures. And his wife, Elaine de Kooning, she also painted figures as well. Here's Mark Rothko. This is the other sort of trajectory of abstract expressionist. It's called color field painting. And color field painting, you're painting these broad bands of color and the color is translucent. And one might say it has a meditative quality to it. It has a calming quality. Whereas paintings like this and Pollock and Krasner, that's action painting. It's, it's literally more active, right? And it's the paint is usually heavier. Now, here are just some works from the 60s and 70s, which uh, Peggy Guggenheim's collecting um, was not as often. I think I mentioned at one point she was collecting a painting a day, but um, she did have, I was surprised, there was quite an extensive collection of art from the 60s and 70s. This is Cy Twombly. Uh, this is op art, Victor Vasa, I'm not sure how, how to pronounce it, Victor Vasarelli. And here is Andy Warhol. And um, Peggy also collected Italian artists. And in particular, she collected abstract expressionist Italian artists, which that's not what Italy is known for. Um, but here is an example. This artist lived in Venice, Edmondo Bacci. And you can see 1956, he's working the same time as Pollock and the American Abstract Expressionists. And um, Gino Severini is, he's called a futurist. The Italians were known for a style called futurism. So what is futurism? Futurism relates to the idea of capturing movement in a painting, but it's the idea in modern life, what happens? Speed accelerates. The invention of the locomotive, the car, right? Um, all of a sudden, just literally time speeds up. And how are we perceiving the world when we're on a train, for example, right? All of a sudden, everything is moving really quickly, isn't it? When we're on an airplane, right? In our everyday life, when we're in a car, we're experiencing the world in a completely different way than generations before us. So these Italian futurists are capturing this movement within the canvas. It's the illusion of movement, right? And even light moving as well. It's like you're moving in and around the form and the form itself is moving. There was also an optimism with, with this kind of art that actually celebrated modern life. Um, and today, maybe it's different, you know, with climate change and all the problems that modernism has brought about and industrialism. We're living in a different time where maybe we're not, um, we're realizing some of the problems that come along with technology and industrialism. I love this artist, Alberto Burry. It's hard to show from the slide, but Alberti Burry, it's sort of combining sculpture and painting. And he wraps the canvas with the, these, um, this like canvas debris that's left over um, from factories. 
And then he combines all sorts of materials embedded onto the canvas itself. And I love this, the canvas becomes an object rather than just a, a painting where the, the paint is creating an illusion of space. The, it brings attention to the three dimensionality of the canvas itself. And there's a mystery to this because it's wrapped. It's like what's underneath. Anyone want to add any of your own expertise or if you've ever been to the collection yourself, uh, what struck you? Or what strikes you about the life of Peggy Guggenheim or Pollock? Anyone? I have a question. I was wondering, I tried to look it up while you were speaking. The mural by Pollock is still in and where is that true it's in Iowa again or where is it exactly at the Stanley Museum of Art in Iowa and let me put the link in right now okay so bear with me I'm gonna pull it up thank you so this is the YouTube channel that I have a lot of these talks you can visit this YouTube channel okay it has all of these topics we had a lot of guest speakers so if you can't make it you can find all of these topics about Pollock and artists and all sorts of themes. But let me put this in the chat. Good question, thank you for that. Um, any other questions? I see Cece, you have your hand up, any comments? Hi, I do. I do have a com comment. I was thinking about why I really like um, um, Jackson Pollock. Um, and I think for me, like I have my own um, history with him as an artist. I'm, I'm also an actor and I remember doing a scene um, uh, from the movie of, of the struggle they were having. This took place in the kitchen and they were talking about, uh, it was about uh, children and all. Um, but what I like about the art and the story and, and is, is that he was a real person. He was a working person who comes from uh, beginnings that are not of rich people. Um, and then the Peggy Guggenheim part of the story is then that um, she has her own story, her own things that she's trying to accomplish in life and that uh, it comes together. And then for Lee, for the fact that, that um, she is the like often unseen hands for a lot of male mm -hmm. artists or artists in general in terms of making them famous and, and putting them forth, but they're never sort of recognized. And so what I like about what you're teaching and what you're doing is you're bringing all of it into focus and there's a complete story. Um, thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. And you know what's great about this era? There's always layers to the story. There's always new things to learn, right? So like you, you'll you enjoy everybody here. Watch that movie, Art Addict. It is so good. It shows all the footage and her interaction with these fame, now famous artists. And um, it also shows the idea that these artists, that even though Pollock is working alone in a barn, it's all about community. It's all about support. What are, and legacy, legacy. What is your legacy gonna be, right? Nice. So Peggy Guggenheim's legacy is this amazing, you know, now the collection, not only promoting the art, but that she created this museum, right? Which is remarkable for all of us to enjoy and learn. It's a resource. Um, and Lee Krasner too, she has a legacy as an artist, as, you know, uh, sp you know, promoting abstract expressionism. And she also created the Paula Krasner Foundation, which gives grants to artists. But I'll tell you what, let's just quickly go to the website of the museum. Let me pull it up. It's really good resource for, especially if you're a beginner and you just want to look up and get some good information. Hold on. Okay, so here it is. Here's the museum, and then it's really user-friendly. You can go to art, right? And it's really good. You can look up artists by, their, by the person's name, right? It's all alphabetized. What's interesting here is I looked up K, and I'm like, did she collect? No, she did not collect any work by Lee Krasner. K 
Okay. But she did have a show of 31 women. It was the first all female art exhibition at that time. Uh, what year was that? No, I forget what year it was. But no, she didn't collect Lee Krasner. Um, but anyway, you could also just browse by this way. And you'll see, look, this is so extensive, right? Look at this, right? And then you can click onto the artwork and it gives this nice little synopsis of the artist and the artwork, but it's not like over, it's not overwhelming. It's not written in a highly academic way. It's just some basic good information, right? So let's see, we have some messages in the chat. I'm glad it was helpful and people enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. I'm glad it was helpful. Okay, and Carol says, I started writing poetry in lockdown and continued to do creative writing. Excellent. Oh, good. Teresa, thanks for putting that link in. I appreciate that. Oh, okay. And the name is Peggy Guggenheim, Art Addict is the name of the film. And why did Peggy Guggenheim choose Venice? I'm not sure. I don't know. But if you've ever been to Venice, it's a really beautiful place. <laughs> so maybe if I was Peggy Guggenheim, I maybe would have chosen Venice. There's no cars. You get around by boat. It's it's a spectacularly beautiful the the architecture the the stonework the paths the bridges it, the light it's it's incredible, and I got to be honest today it did remind me a little of the Hamptons where it's really overrun with tourists so it almost seems like the whole city is like a playground for tourists it reminded me a little bit of the Hamptons now. Um, and maybe because of the biennials, that's a good point, Martin. I mean, and I'm so glad we got a good turnout. So thank you, thank you. Thanks see you a lot. Thank, thank you, Joyce. Thank you from everybody who your art is. So see you too. See you too, Martin. And will that lecture be on the website, The Pollock and Alcoholism? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Joyce. Aw, thank you.